throughout the first year, throughout the year that I've studied global in the school, I've realized that there is some problems with how we approach ass assessments in global specifically. Um, sometimes we don't have case studies from particular regions of the world. So most of the case studies we study are from the US or Europe. Um, and we sometimes ignore some regions of the world that are really important. One of them being Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and Monica has made a very big effort in our block and in our year to have different case studies from those regions. Um, and basically what I'm talking about today is a case study specifically from Latin America that is happening right now. Um, and it's a really important case study that you can use in the key concepts of legitimacy, in the key concept of sovereignty, in the key concept of international relations. Um, and everything that I'm talking about here is very useful in basically every assessment you can have in Global, either paper one or paper two, or your HLX or your engagement activity, which are things that you will discover throughout the year. Um, basically, before I talk about what the pink tie is, it's important to give historical context. Um, during the 50s and during the 60s, uh, the Cold War was at its peak. So the Soviet Union and the U.S. were fighting for influence in the world. Um, and the U.S. had a big influence in Latin America because it's basically its own continent. All over the Americas, um, the U.S. was very, 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 had a very big grip on all the countries there. Um, but what started happening was that in some countries, they started having um, disagreements and um, conflicts about how this capitalist system and how this country of the U.S. is influencing um, their policies and politics. Um, and that started happening specifically in Cuba. In 1959, um, the Cuban Revolution took place, and Cuba was the first communist country in the Americas. And because of that, um, the U.S. was very threatened by the presence of a state that was allied to the Soviet Union so close to home. And they started having a policy of intervening more and more and more in Latin American countries. Basically, every Latin American country has had a dictator that was implemented by the US except for Costa Rica. So Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, every country in Latin America has had at some point in time a dictator that was established by the US. So. What happened during these interventions was um, a very awful time. Uh, most of them took 20, 30 years uh, for democracy to be reestablished in these countries. Um, there was uh, people being exiled, people being tortured, people being killed. Democracy was not being respected in these countries. Uh, there was no vote for presidency. In Brazil, the dictatorship took place from 1964 until basically 1990s. Um, and the first time that someone could vote for president in Brazil ever since 1964 was in 1989. So it took a long time for us to be able to have a full-on democracy established again. Um, and it was a very hard period where censorship was taking place, where no one could actually like voice their opinions in a proper manner. Um, and this happened all throughout Latin America, not only in Brazil, in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia, in Peru. Uh, in Chile. In the 2000s, with the end of the Cold War and the period of redemocratization of the whole world, what started happening was that the populations in Latin America started drifting away from the whole fear of communism and socialism. And the terms, because these terms are associated very much with the idea of, well, they're going to eat children, they're going to, I don't know, like come and, and, and do all of these dictatorships in our countries. Um, and because of that, people in Latin America started drifting towards a more left-wing wave. Um, and that started happening mostly um, because of one particular country, and that is Venezuela. So in the beginning of the millennium, Venezuela uh, had a very important leader that kind of drifted the regime into a very weird dictatorship. Um, so Hugo Chavez, he was a very socialist leader that started using a term that is the socialism of the 21st century. So he would believe that from now on, the conversations about Marxism in our societies always has to be incorporated with the discussions about capitalism. So you can never like fully eliminate capitalism. You have to adopt certain socialism policies alongside capitalism. And those policies would be basically like pension, um, education, um, free healthcare for everyone, 
Um, but that's good in theory. And in practice, there was a different thing happening. What was happening in Latin America during that period of time was an economical boom. So every country in Latin America started electing leftist governments um, while this economical boom was happening. Oil was found in Brazil, oil was found in Venezuela, in other countries. Um, there was an economical striving happening, even though there was like a global tendency in Latin America that was happening even more because those were developing countries that were industrializing themselves for the first time. Um, and this economical boom basically made all these social policies very successful because when you have money and when you have your economy thriving, it's very easy for you to invest money into social policies. Um, but that started to change once the global 2009 financial crisis hit. And there was an economical recession and associated with that, there was a more authoritarian act happening in certain countries from these leftist governments. Um, specifically, Venezuela was one of these countries where um, the government was not accepting that this economical recession had driven the population into a different political direction, and it started having authoritarian um, aspects to it. So today, the elections in Venezuela are not recognized by most, the biggest part of the world, because um, they're accused of being rigged, they're accused of being manipulated, they're accused of being, um, the ballot boxes are not actually um, safe or represent the will of the Venezuelan population. Um, with that, with that economical recession, with all of the problems associated with the economical inequality that started happening in all the continents, a new wave started happening. So it's the blue wave. And this blue wave basically means right-wing governments were being elected all throughout the continent. So it was a, an immediate reaction to the leftist governments being in the period of time having a government during an economical recession, new right-wing governments were elected. In Argentina, this is um, Mauricio Macri, who was the president in Argentina a couple of years ago. Um, he was very famously right-wing. Um, and that led space to populism in most of the continent. So because of that economical recession, the speeches about corruption, about problems of like uh, the traditional families of Latin America and the protection of the costumes of the family, started happening in most of the countries, um, specifically in Brazil. So um, Bolsonaro, who is a very populist leader, he won his election on a speech of anti-corruption and on a speech of trying to bring back the original family values of what Brazil is and fighting the gay agenda, fighting new ways of seeing family, fighting um, disturbing manners of social progression. Um, and he basically, has done a bunch of things. Basically, he has led 700,000 Brazilians to die over the pandemic. Uh, he hasn't buy, he hasn't bought vaccines for the population of Brazil in the proper timing. He has denied Pfizer's requests for buying vaccines more than 80 times. Um, he said that vaccines turn you into an alligator. He said that he wouldn't, um, rape a congresswoman in Brazil because she wasn't worth it in the National Congress. Um, and all of these acts kind of show how the population in Latin America as a whole started drifting towards a more right-wing government. But what's been happening in recent times is that that tide has recently changed again. So now, with the social inequality of the pandemic, which led to a bunch of social problems in Latin America specifically because all the countries there were struggling a lot with the pandemic, specifically Peru had the biggest numbers of deaths per capita in the world for the pandemic. Um, and um, because of that, social inequality grew a lot and a new tide of political leaders came again into Latin America. And this is happening right now. Um, we have a resurgence of the left wing in Latin America. This is the president right now of Colombia. He's the first president in Colombia to be from a left-wing party. He's the first socialist president of Colombia. Um, and this has been happening all throughout the continent. So if you guys follow the news, you know that Chile has elected a very young president. He's um, on the age gap of 30. And he's associated with a new image of the left in Latin America. It's a new movement that tries to restore the faith in renewal, political renewal, social um, policies, um, social inclusion, LGBTQ rights, um, and um, different progressive agendas. <laughs> 
So these are three different maps from three different time zones in Latin America. This was in the beginning of the year 2000. So every country that is in red is governed by a left-wing party, and every country that is in blue is governed by a right-wing party. As you guys can see, in the beginning of the century, like most of the countries in Latin America were governed by a left-wing party. That changed with the economical recession, um, and most of the countries in Latin America started being governed by right-wing governments from 2015 onwards. And now, this is the map of how Latin America looks like right now. Right now, most of the countries are already being governed by left-wing parties, except for Brazil, um, Ecuador, and some countries in Central America, as well as Uruguay um, and Paraguay. But these countries have had, they're going to have elections very soon, and these elections indicate that left-wing parties will also be established in these countries. The problem here is that you can clearly see that there is a very extreme shift of power in very like close years. So from 2015, this is the situation, and in 2022, this is the situation. In seven years, the political landscape of Latin America as a whole has changed completely. And that shows that there is a problem with democracy in Latin America. That shows that democracy is not very stable there. People are not being very consistent with voting for um, people that actually can represent them. They're voting for people who are the extremes, the populists, the people who are at the extreme of the political aspect. Um, and that is a bigger problem and a wider problem than just talking about a simple tide of politicians. There's too many ties happening, and that ties back into a problem of the structure of democracy in these countries. Basically, right now, um, I hope most of you know this, has, this is happening. Um, the Brazilian elections are taking place. So Bolsonaro, who was the populist leader of Latin America, is now threatened in his office, but not so much so. Um, it's an interesting case study because Lula, who is the opponent candidate to Bolsonaro, he's actually, he has been the president who has brought the pink tide to Brazil. He was the president first elected in 2002, um, and um, he has governed the country until 2010, um, and now he's coming back. All the polls indicate that he will probably win the election in the second round, so um, that will probably happen, but still, what this shows is that there is a structural problem with how the democracy is working in Brazil and in other countries of Latin America. Um, Bolsonaro, in the first round of the elections that happened last Sunday, had 43% of the votes against 48% of Lula. This shows that a still a, a majority of the population still believes that Bolsonaro is the best suited candidate to be governing Brazil right now. Um, and this shows that there is a polarization happening and that's a big problem when it comes to democracies, because the best way that you can have a democracy is when everyone can express their opinion freely um, and not be into the extreme political aspect spectrums. What's happening in Brazil is that we have a candidate that comes from the socialism pink tie and another politician who comes from the populism right wing, far right wing um, area. And that generates a lot of polarization. It affects democracy. It affects the way that we can relate to each other as a population, and it it's really scary. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. That's Pink Tide in Latin America.